Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, I'm going to be doing a tire rotation on my Tesla Model 3 Long Range. Now in the roughly eight months that I've owned this car so far, I've put over 8,000 miles on it. And as a result, I am overdue for a tire rotation. Now the nice thing about a Tesla Model 3 is that it uses the same size tires and same type of tires on both the front and the rear, unlike the plaid version of the Model S which has slightly larger tires in the rear and thus does not allow a direct rear to front tire rotation. Now I should note that I am by no means an expert on Tesla tire rotation. I've done quite a lot of tire rotations on other cars, but this will be a first time for this and it will definitely be a learning experience for all of us. In addition to rotating the tires, I'm also going to be repairing a puncture in the rear passenger tire. I previously used a repair patch or a repair plug on this tire and it's held up for a few months, however it has been gradually leaking air. So I'm going to see if I can do something about that while the tire is off the car. Let's have a look at the tools I'll be using to perform this job. I'll be using a floor jack, a jack stand, a torque wrench, an impact driver or impact wrench, and a specialty set of lifting pucks for Tesla Model 3s. These lifting pucks for Tesla can be acquired for about $20 for a set of four, and they are quite important as what these allow you to do is locate your jack in the correct location under the chassis to ensure that you won't damage or puncture the battery or any other critical parts of the car. For the tire puncture repair, I'm going to be using a set of temporary tire patch plugs along with the tools, the awl and insertion tool that come with it. I'm also going to be adding some uh, self-vulcanizing uh, rubber tire cement which should help solidify this and reduce the likelihood of future leaks. These tire patch kits are not really intended to be used uh, permanently in the long term, but I've had pretty good success with them and generally uh, I'm not too concerned about it failing, so I'm going to just go ahead and use this uh, as my primary repair method for the time being. So before I raise the car off the ground, I am going to work on removing the covers, the aero wheel covers. Uh, this one is the only rim that has a little bit of curbing damage, so I'm going to start with this one as a sort of guinea pig. Uh, once I have the technique down, I'm going to remove all four aero covers before lifting the car off the ground. So from what I saw on the internet, supposedly all you have to do is grab the rim and just pull and kind of lever against the tire and it should snap off. Uh, apparently there's just some snap features holding this cover on. So what I'm going to do is try that. So there's one section, one sector of this aero cover. There's another sector. There's one. There's another. So I've gotten all the edge sectors out, but it still feels like a pretty strong grab in the center. Like it doesn't really want to come out. There it is though. So that's the entire arrow cover off. All right, on to the next one. There it is. So now all four of our aero covers have been removed from the rims. This means we can now lift the car and begin the disassembly process for taking the rims off and rotating the tires. Now I'm going to be using an impact wrench to remove the lug nuts from the wheels. Uh, so I'm going to do that with the car off the ground. That way I don't accidentally spin the lug completely off while there's load on the lug nut shafts or the lug nut studs. Uh, but if you are using a wrench or a, just a regular uh, tire iron to remove these, you may want to loosen them up with the car on the ground just so that you have better uh, leverage against the locked tire that's in position. If we take a look underneath the car, what we'll see is a small round hole. You can see where this is located relative to the back tire. And that's where we're going to insert our lifting puck. Let's see if we can get this puck inserted. We'll do the exact same maneuver over on the front. So what we'll do is we're going to search for the little hole, as you can see here. Stick the puck in so it sits and holds itself in place. And that's where we're going to put our other jack or our jack stand. So now what I'm going to do is attempt to line up the pad of the jack directly underneath our lift point. So we'll see if we can get that lined up and if the jack is in fact 
low enough to the ground to get in there because that's going to be pretty tight. Yeah, let me actually try the front one and see if maybe it's slightly higher than this. We might be a little better off over here. We might just make it under. Yeah, we do. So I guess my rear is just slightly lower than my front. So I guess at this point, what I'm gonna do is uh, show you how this lifting process works. So based on what I've been told and what I've seen on the internet, lifting the Tesla from just one side will actually lift the entire side of the car up. It's pretty well balanced and the jack points are located in such a location that the entire car's center of gravity is basically distributed evenly around that point. So the whole thing should go up. Now, it's not strictly necessary to use a jack stand as, like I said, the whole car can be supported from one point, but for safety, it's gonna be a good idea to get a jack stand under that second puck. perfectly balanced it sure does lean back a lot but it is uh, off the ground on both sides so let's see if we can get the jack stand in position it's got a little bit more to go if we want that on there all right I'll let it down a little bit to just put a little load on that jack stand about 50-50 weight distribution between the service jack and the jack stand so this will be a good place to work from I'd say. So clearly the balance is not quite as spectacular as I expected it to be but nevertheless it is off the ground on both wheels quite a bit more so than it needs to be but I did want to get that protective jack stand under there so from there that's where I'm probably going to proceed. So I just took a look and this is a 21 millimeter lug nut, so that's what we're going to be using to remove these, and we'll be using the impact wrench to spin these off. Now I should mention, only ever use an impact wrench for removing lug nuts, never for putting them back on. It's really important that we don't over torque these or torque them too much one at a time. We want to very evenly reapply the torque, and you want to torque them to the correct specification upon completion of the torquing process. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the wheel. Now this is the one we're going to be doing some repair work on, so I'm going to cut over to working on that next. So now that I have this tire off of the car, I'm going to be removing the old tire patch that I had plugging the hole on this puncture location. Now this patch has held up pretty well for at least the last 3,000 miles or so, uh, but it has been leaking air very slowly. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it out, allow the tire to depressurize, and then I'm going to put in a replacement patch with some extra rubber cement to reinforce it. Alright, let's see what we can do here. So initially I'm just going to try some needle nose pliers and see if I can just yank this thing out. It may just fragment apart, in which case I'll use the awl to kind of shove it in, maybe to just displace it into the interior of the tire. I mean, this is clearly, I mean, it is in there pretty well. It probably wouldn't have come out anytime soon, but it definitely has been slow leaking, so we want to get it out. We can hear it hissing a little bit now, so clearly we've expanded the leak slightly. And this is a fairly high pressure tire. This is at 40 PSI, so this thing's going to really go when it's ready to go. Slower leak than I thought, but my guess is if we clear it out a little with the awl, we'll get a nice steady flow and we'll let it depressurize to a lower level. We also want to abrade the inside of the puncture to make the new patch stick a little better. Yeah, that thing's actually sealed up pretty well. I, I may end up using the Schrader, the Schrader valve. There we go. That's what I want to see. So 
we're gonna let this thing go down and then we'll put the new one in. All right, while the tire's airing down over away from the camera, I'm gonna go ahead and pull out one of our patch cords or patch plugs. So what I like to do is I like to try and kind of preload it onto the insertion tool. About like that. So what we'll be able to do like this is sort of invert it like this, shove it into the hole, and then pull the insertion tool out. And we'll do that with some additional uh, rubber cement, which is going to help seal that hole and make it a little bit closer to a, a permanent solution. Although, as I said earlier, this is very much designed to be a temporary solution. You may not want to use this as your primary tire sealing solution long term. All right, the tire is fully aired down and I've exposed the puncture location so we can go ahead and perform the insertion. So I've got a set of this Hornet tire flammable vulcanizing cement. I believe this is basically just regular rubber cement, but this is supposed to be better for tires. All I'm going to do is put a little bit of this on my tire repair patch to lubricate it and to help it stick once it's fully inserted into the hole. I'm basically just going to drive it in and try my best to get it as deeply into the tire as I can. And you can see it's pretty much in there now. So you don't really have to do a lot else other than trim it. Now you don't want to stick it in so far that it actually drops into the tire because that wouldn't be good. But now the trick is going to be pulling the removal tool out like I just did without pulling the patch out. So at this point, I'm going to grab a paper towel, clean up the excess cement, and I'll just get some sharp side cutters and cut this close to flush so it doesn't grab uh, objects in the road and pull itself out later. All right, so I'm just going to wipe any excess cement or cementaceous material off of here. And then I've got some side cutters. I know I didn't show these in the toolkit, but you can really use anything you want. And I'm just going to gnaw my way through the patch and try to cut it as close to flush as I can. You want to leave a little bit so it doesn't get stuck inside the tire. I mean, uh, push itself inside the tire. Uh, but make it low enough that it isn't going to grab things in the road and extract itself over time because it would not be great if this thing decided it just wanted to fly out while you were driving. That can happen. That is why they call these temporary plugs. I haven't personally ever had one pop out while I was driving, but supposedly it is a risk. So be advised of that if you're going to do that. That should be good. We can air this thing up now. All right, so I got some soapy water. We're just gonna coat this patch area in soapy water. And what we wanna look for are any like accumulating bubbles. So any bubbles that weren't there before that are building up on their own. And you can see there's some froth from the soap itself, but it does not appear there's any accumulation or growing of bubbles in that area. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and pull the other tire. Well, we got this thing in the air, I figured we might as well take a little bit of a look at some of the hardware since I haven't actually seen one up close in person in terms of the internals. So definitely a sophisticated powertrain system. You can see the CV axle right there is running to what I believe is a differential or possibly gear reduction. And then that is coupled with a sizable electric motor that's our power, our drive module, which is actually going to be providing the power for the car. Other than that, you can see a number of different suspension features holding this rotor, I guess you call it, onto the rear suspension. We've got struts, we've got springs, and it's all around just what you'd expect for a modern high-performance electric vehicle. We can also have a look around the front. Nice big Tesla branded brake calipers. You can see again suspension parts if we go around here we can see the steering rack hardware and then because this is a dual motor one we've got a cv axle running to yet another big electric motor now this electric motor i believe is a little bit smaller than the one on the rear i think this is an induction type motor where the one on the rear is a permanent magnet bldc so pretty cool hardware and definitely a sweet ride 
All right, and just for reference, the torque spec on these is going to be 129 foot-pounds, which is pretty reasonable for a high-performance rim. It's quite a lot of torque, but these are quite large studs. So first, I'm going to get the wheel back up on the studs, so make sure you get the right side in and the right side out. And luckily, these are not overly heavy wheels. A lot of the cars I've worked on have just enormous off-road tires, i.e. dune buggies, jeeps, other such beasts. But here, you can lift the wheel on by hand. I'm just going to loosely seat these by finger tight, and then I'm going to start going around in a cross pattern so that I'm evenly applying torque as I bring this to final spec. See, it's not quite on there all the way. I got to push it a little further back before these will actually go all the way down. See, now they're all going to be easy to finger tighten again. So we'll resume that. Just a little bit of resistance, so I'm going to go across. A little bit of resistance, cross again. Again, same story. A little bit more. And then I'm back to my original one. So now I'm gonna get that just, I'm not gonna call that tight, but just a little bit. Start putting a little pressure on these. So at this point, it would definitely be safe to bring the wheel down. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'm gonna go put the front one on. And then I'm gonna take these to final specification with the car on the ground. All right, so we're gonna do the same deal up front. I got it on there, get a couple of lugs. Now I'm gonna just make sure it is cinched all the way up so that it'll be nice and easy to start spinning these lugs down. So now I'll get the rest of the lugs on. Let me just pick up where I left off on my phone. The GoPro actually just overheated. Uh, it's about 105 Fahrenheit out today, and uh, I guess it decided it needed to cool down. So I'm filming on my phone. I'm just going to go around and take these to a final, very light tightening since this wheel is not locked. And then I'll be putting the vehicle down to take everything to final spec. All right, so before I fully lower the vehicle, what I'm going to do is raise it up a little bit so I can pull the jack stand out and then I'm going to lower it down onto its tires so that we can then take the lug nuts to final spec. So let me lift it up a few pumps. Now we're off the jack stand. We should be able to pull it out. Now at this point, the hydraulic jack's the only thing supporting the car, so we don't want to get anywhere near being under it. And to the best of my ability, I'm going to slowly bring this thing down. All right, so we're back on our own tires. Now I should be able to roll that guy out. And now we can go get our final torque spec down. Now I am gonna probably take a couple more passes below full torque before I go all the way to full. Because 129 foot-pounds is a lot. It is that's 129 on that one 129 on that one 129 there 129 129 now I'm gonna go through all five one more time just to be sure see that one had, was not quite at 129 anymore that's why it's important to always do it a second time Uh, that one was also just slightly under. So we're good now. We can move to the front. So I'll start here. I'm just going to gradually go around raising the torque 
of opposing lugs. All right, that one's at 129. That one's at 129. 129. 129. And 129. Now I'm going to go around again. And 129. So this is also good to go. Now don't forget to remove your lifting pucks when you're finished and just pop them out one at a time. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the whole same procedure on this side. Well, I guess my estimate of it being 105 out was a little low. Apparently it's actually 110. That's probably why it felt so hot while I was out working. All right, well now that the test drive was completed successfully, I'm gonna go ahead and double check all of the lug nuts for full tightness, and then I will reinstall the aero covers. All right, well, now that I have put all four aero covers back on the rims, this project is complete. I have successfully rotated the tires in a front to back rotation on this Model 3, and I've additionally performed a repair on the tire with a previous puncture, so it should leak less air in the future. I'd say with that, this project is now complete. On an upcoming video, you can look forward to a more in-depth review of this Tesla Model 3 as it has been an incredibly cool car and I can't wait to share some of my insights, experiences, and overall impressions with the car. Uh, but until then, thanks for watching this video. I'll see you next time.